Thank you for the invitation, Dr. Park, to uh, present this uh, topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so, uh, the, again, the objectives of this is just to describe how we can adopt minimally invasive spinal uh, tech surgery techniques uh, specific for spinal oncology, and then discuss uh, an algorithm of how to uh, work through if you are presented with a vertebral body fracture from a, from a cancer patient, and then explore future applications, which would include robotics and endoscopy. Um, as we all know, uh, greater than 20% of cancer patients uh, eventually develop spinal metastases. And this is increasing in trend at this point. Uh, we're having better methods of detecting uh, cancers through advanced imaging. And then we're having uh, improved systemic uh, treatments so the patients are surviving longer and many of the newer agents may not penetrate through bone as well as it does through uh, the, the rest of the bloodstream and uh, the visceral organs. Uh, therefore, we're seeing more uh, bony disease. Now, ultimately, the, the goal of metastatic spine surgery is uh, could be either pain control, stabilization of the spinal column, preserving neurological function, or just local tumor control. And ultimately, it is a palliative surgery, and the goal is to improve the quality of life of these patients. So it's really incumbent upon us to do this in the, the least invasive way possible uh, so the patient can get back to their life, get back to their systemic treatments, as you all know. Uh, treatment for these diseases are uh, multidisciplinary, so it's going to be a combination of systemic treatment, radiation, and then some form of surgery, typically. So ultimately, our goal is to get the surgery done as quickly and as efficiently as possible so the patient can resume their systemic treatment or their radiation. Any major surgery that we do, it just disrupts their overall oncological treatment plan. Uh, you guys may have heard of the, the NOMS, NOMS uh, Decision Framework, and specifically what we'll be looking at today is just the mechanical component of this. You know, uh, is, when a patient has a spinal fracture, um, can they withstand that physiological load? Do they have biomechanical pain? If they do, then we typically are fusing these patients or fixating them, um, and we typically use this SINS, uh, the Spinal Instability Neoplastic Score, uh, so we often use this in all of our patients to figure out how relatively unstable their fracture is. Um, and, you know, like I said, as we're moving more and more towards minimally invasive spine surgery, the ultimate uh, precedent for that is that um, the systemic treatments have gotten so much better, and so has the uh, options for radiation. So with stereotactic radiosurgery, <coughs> we're able to create a conformal plan that's really, really great delivery of a high dose of radiation to the tumor target with a very steep drop off to the adjacent organs or adjacent neural tissues. And therefore, you, in the past, you may have done had to do a, a very large in-block resection uh, for, in this example, a solitary renal cell metastasis. Um, whereas nowadays, if there isn't significant cord compression, that, sur that surgery would have been completely replaced by just stereotactic radiosurgery. So this really brings into uh, consideration what do we really need to do for these patients. And so basically, uh, we are all very familiar with minimally invasive uh, spine surgery techniques in the degenerative spine population, trauma, and sometimes deformities. And the, the benefits are clear, less tissue disruption, smaller incisions, potentially less operating time, definitely shorter hospital stays, and less opioid usage. And these advantages are uh, exemplified in the cancer patients as well. As you can imagine, these patients are very medically frail. They have poor wound healing due to their history of systemic chemotherapy. Um, they're often on a significant amounts of opioid use uh, due to their intractable cancer pain. So by adopting the techniques that we feel comfortable with uh, in terms of MIS techniques for the DGN population and bringing it to the spine patient, you can really uh, achieve these surgical goals while minimizing disruptions and um, to their systemic medications or their radiation treatments. Uh, and so a lot of the MIS techniques that we use is really uh, a partnership with the enabling technology, as we just showed before, using navigation. Um, so in terms of MIS techniques for spinal oncology, uh, we broke this down into two different categories. Ultimately, first for spinal stabilization, we're uh, very often doing percutaneous fixation techniques, um, you know, smaller incisions, less chance of a wound breakdown. And we've also um, started to go smaller and smaller with our constructs by using cement augmented screws. 
Uh, in terms of the de decompression, if that's needed, often I'm using uh, tubular retractors for central decompression or, uh, or an expandable retractor if I need to get a little bit wider. And then in terms of emerging technology, now we're starting to explore endoscopy, robotics, like the Da Vinci uh, robot as well. Um, so in terms of the MIS techniques with the percutaneous fixation, just as I was showing uh, in the cadaver uh, session right before this, um, we try to navigate every single screw. It's become sort of the standard of care for these patients, um, starting from the very beginning where we would plan the skin incision um, to be a perfect trajectory uh, for your screw and then navigate every single instrument possible. Um, with a, This is a navigate drill guide and then even uh, placing the, the screw and confirming the depth of it. And uh, the advantage is very clear for us. You have cancer patients that have typically very poor bone quality, so they tend to have suboptimal imaging on fluoroscopy alone, and then you also are missing some of that tactile uh, feel that we're used to in a standard degenerative case because their bone is much softer. So that's where the advantage of using some sort of CT-based or 3D fluoro-based uh, navigation, you just have improved visualization and increased accuracy. Uh, and important for me, I, I often am uh, using fenestrated screws, and the advantage of that is that you have better uh, pull-out purchase, and because I'm using cement um, augmentation with that, uh, I want to have very few revisions in terms of like when I'm cannulating up a pedicle, and, so, and I don't want any breaches because I'm afraid of having uh, some cement extravasation. So that merging of using navigation for every single screw um, and then cementing those screws uh, uh, will allows uh, us to go from very long constructs uh, to very short constructs, which again, smaller over time, shorter over time, uh, smaller incisions, uh, shorter length of stay. And here's just a quick shot of in our OR showing uh, a lateral fluoroscopy uh, with some percutaneous screws above and below, and then a jam sheeting needle at the tumor level for uh, a vertebroplasty. Now, in terms of the decompression techniques, uh, very often we're doing uh, a decompression in the lumbar area if there's unilateral pedicle involvement, perhaps a nerve root compression uh, using uh, two tubulars, just like you may feel comfortable doing this uh, through a microdiscectomy. Uh, we're using the same sort of techniques. Um, if, if you're very familiar with an MIS T lift, I've essentially adopted that what I've learned um, in the DGEN population using an MIS T lift to do an MIS separation surgery now. Um, so this algorithm that was made uh, by my mentors at Sloan Kettering uh, is usually what we're using for our patients and trying to see if we can fit them in for uh, an MIS procedure. So typically, if you have a patient with a compression fracture, the, the ultimate first question for me is, is a decompression needed? If it's in thoracic spine and it's, there's a significant amount of high-grade cord compression uh, centrally, then I'm typically uh, performing percutaneous screws followed by a very mini open using um, an expandable retractor. Um, such as an, an x left retractor to really space out, to, to use a small incision, but really get the amount of wide tissue exposure that you need to do a central decompression. If they don't have a central, de uh, if a central decompression is not required, but we're in the lumbar spine perhaps, and they have mechanical radiculopathy from you know, unilateral pedicle involvement or unilateral um, nerve root compression, then I would do uh, percutaneous screws followed by unilateral uh, either hemilaminectomy or facetectomy using a tubular retractor. Again, very similar to what we would, what you guys have known, uh, feel familiar doing with an MIS T lift, for example. Um, and then if we don't need to do a decompression, but there is some cord compression that we're worried about um, doing a cement augmentation at the tumor level, and you know there are some tumors that you don't need to decompress because they're very sensitive to radiation. So in those cases, we're just doing percutaneous screws uh, so with cement augmentation above and below uh, the tumor level. Finally, if that fracture does extend into the posterior elements, then we're doing percutaneous screws plus a kyphoplasty as long as the, there's not a significant concern of core compression um, uh, at the tumor level. And finally, if the posterior elements are not involved, then a simple kyphoplasty. So just as an example of a workflow, um, for one example here, we have a 61-year-old male uh, who has lung cancer. They presented with back pain, and they had a left-sided uh, L3 radiculopathy and an obvious L3 vertebral body met. And again, their disease was unilateral and uh, just affect and just compressing the, the exit nerve root there. So this patient didn't need a central decompression, but they did have mechanical radiculopathy. So we 
performed percutaneous screws and then a, a mini open uh, tubular decompression. And just as an example of how short we've become, here's a post-op uh, CT myelogram showing just a very small uh, hemilaminotomy, uh, medial facetectomy, um, really just opening up that foramen and uh, decompressing that nerve root and getting rid of uh, resecting any tumor that just are adjacent to it. And then these patients are getting uh, post-op radiation very quickly, usually less than 14 days. Uh, essentially, we tell our radiation oncologists that they can start planning their radiation within two or three two to three days of surgery, as long as the, the wounds look great. And we've had very few issues with wound dehiscence um, with the radiation being so close because we're doing very small stab incisions here. Um, this type of uh, algorithm has been validated uh, prospectively. Um, so we've shown that uh, patients following this algorithm have decreased pain uh, severity, decreased symptom interference with their daily activities, um, very significant uh, improvements. So finally, MIS for spine metastatic disease, it's safe, it's effective. Um, uh, if you have a patient with mechanical instability, the benefit is uh, with the percutaneous stabilization techniques, uh, you can minimize your incisions, you can also cement them to minimize how many points of fixation you need. Um, and then I think the, the next advanced technology is, uh, can we use endoscopy, can we use robotics um, for this? Another couple, two quick examples for that. Uh, here is a patient that we, our first case at UW of an endoscopic separation surgery. So this was a patient with a, a metastatic thymoma. He had a, a grade 1C epidural spinal cord compression at T3-4 from a, a lung met that extended through the foramen. This patient needed a proton therapy uh, due to the, the specific pathology here at thymoma. Uh, so the radiation oncology recommended, um, they requested separation surgery because uh, they said that they could not achieve the, the amount of accuracy that they wanted. Um, so they wanted a little bit more margin of error here. And then similarly, because they're using proton uh, beam therapy, they also requested that we either don't use any hardware so that there's less scatter for the radiation, or we use a, a very expensive uh, sort of carbon peak uh, instrumentation system. So we thought this was a great case of unilateral disease, just needing a little bit of separation. Um, so this was our first case of endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, endoscopic separation surgery. So again, here's a few screenshots of the fluoroscopy, just uh, doing a transforaminal approach, um, reaming uh, that area, getting into this, the foramen that was needed. Um, and here's a quick picture again, uh, showing here that we see the spinal cord um, deep to us here, and there's some epidural disease here in the foramen that we were able to resect. Uh, Post-operative scans here, you can see the, here's a preoperative MRI. And again, we're just decompressing that part. And this was enough uh, for our radiation oncologists uh, to deliver. So again, this was outpatient surgery for metastatic disease. Um, one more technique uh, for uh, emerging technique is robotics, as we well know. In terms of things like the da Vinci, it's used extensively for thoracic surgery, abdominal surgery. Um, <coughs> At areas where we have a large cavity. So currently we've adapted this technique for spinal lesions that may uh, extend into one of these cavities. Uh, some disadvantages are there are limited tool sets available for true bony work, and it's obviously a steep learning curve for many of us who are not robotic trained. So uh, when we did this in my fellowship, we were often doing this in partnership with uh, the a field that's more comfortable with this. For example, in this case here, this was a, a large, large thoracic uh, tumor. Uh, so we did this surgery with um, our thoracic colleagues. Here's the Da Vinci setup. And again, a beautiful visualization of this, uh, uh, this uh, thoracic tumor here. Um, and beautiful resection uh, was achieved with a really small port incisions. So again, in conclusion, uh, the role of surgery, uh, separation surgery, uh, our goal is really to create a safe radiation target at this point. Uh, we're trying to preserve neurological function and stabilize um, any sort of mechanical instability. So minimally invasive techniques needed with uh, enabling technology can be adopted to achieve these goals while minimizing disruption to systemic therapies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, great talk, Anu. And I think you emphasized some of the key points of uh, where uh, actually spinal oncology has gone to. You know, I, I grew up actually now, I was 18 years out of my training. And when I trained, uh, particularly when I was an early attending, the goal was maximal resection of metastatic disease, which kind of doesn't make sense, right? It's already systemic. And the thought process was you, you if it's a spinal metastasis, particularly if it was a single site of focus, 
do a vertebrectomy, just clear the disease there, prevent local recurrence, and that, that was a whole goal, but it was an extremely morbid procedure. Um, so even if everything went perfectly, you know, they had to recover for two to three months before they were back to normal, but then their lifespan is what? Months, measured in months. So they're spending mo a lot of their life just recovering, and if you had a complication, spent the remaining life just recovering from the complication. It was, you know, awful. And when Bilski, I think, uh, was the first to like propose this NOMS framework and separation surgery, I, I think it was a, a huge advance. And you know, a lot of that depended on technology as well. Without you know, percutaneous instrumentation, which guidance, tubular techniques, for example, probably wouldn't have happened. But now, you know, the goal is clear. It's palliative. You're just trying to preserve their quality of life as best you can because you're not probably going to impact their survival. Um, so, you know, I, I know you alluded to a little bit of where you think this is going. It's, it's gone from maximally aggressive to now fairly minimal invasive. With, I, I like the perk screws, the, the cement for increased fixations or sort of segment. Where do you think uh, it's going to go now? I mean, do you think, you know, you alluded to endoscopy. Do you think you could do a good job of creating a margin? I mean, that's the whole goal uh, with endoscopic techniques and, you know, if that's the case, I mean, why can't you do radiation two days? You know, if you have a you know a very small yep. incision versus the fourteen days, yep, I guess that's still you know a lo long uh, time to wait. Actually, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. At this point, uh, I think the, the future is going to be as we discuss, you know, percutaneous stabilization and either a minimal invasive decompression, whether that's through a small tube or endosco endoscopy. So we're trying to pioneer that with uh, endoscopy, Dr. Hofstetter and I. And so, our ultimate goal for us is: can we get them? on and off the table as quickly as possible so that they can resume their systemic treatment and start their radiation right away. So right now, uh, for that one example I showed of endoscopy, that was outpatient surgery. And uh, the only reason there was like a 14 day delay is they wanted new MRI scans and then to replan their simulation because there's some post-op fluids. So yeah, I, we gave them permission to uh, start chemotherapy, resume chemotherapy and start the radiation within two to three days. And sometimes now we're having the issue of just workflow issues of how can we get it done quicker from the, from the other side of things. Really awesome talk. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, you know, where, where do you think that you know other you know technologies come in? You know, like for example, you know alternative material for, for screws to, for radiation. Where do you think that you know? How do you think that plays into metastatic disease, and also using the lit laser and sort of you know there's a couple of centers that are trying to do that. How does it fit in, or you know do you think there's a role for that? Yeah. So in terms of the, the second option we talked about, uh, you, you mentioned is the laser interstitial uh, therapy. So there's a few centers that are pioneering that as well, mainly uh, MD Anderson. Um, and so with their group, they're first we're starting to use that for patients again medically frail patients, maybe too sick for an open surgery. Can we uh, navigated, uh, can we navigate a jam sheeting needle down into the epidural space, place a, a laser lead, and then go to an intraop MRR um, and ablate that. Uh, so they've had great success with that, and I think that that is the future, that type of minimally invasive technologies. Uh, right now, it's still a little bit limited to really high-end centers that may have you know, the ability for intraoperative scans. It's still a fairly long process. Um, so I think the question for, from our standpoint is, would it be easier for us to quickly adopt uh, these other techniques that we're familiar with, like a tubular decompression or endoscopy, to get the same job done. So I think there's a role for that, um, and we're still trying to find that emerging, uh, what's the right balance. Uh, in terms of the first question about what other technologies, so as these patients are surviving longer and longer, uh, we probably will run to an issue where, hey, maybe we're not getting great fusion if we're doing a perk stabilization and we may have hardware issues, or uh, if we're putting in a lot of cement through titanium screws, we're having difficulty visualizing if there's any recurrence. And that's where this other, uh, there's a lot of uh, two different companies that are making uh, carbon peak screws, uh, which uh, provide a great amount of ability to really see through them on CAT scan as well as MRI. So ultimate uh, improved uh, visualization. And where um, some groups are saying that they can actually detect recurrences much sooner um, because of that uh, improved visualization. Uh, right now, another uh, big issue with that is just a new technology, high costs and in this cost-saving world, it's hard to justify um, in patients with metastatic disease if, if there's a predicted low uh, survival to use such expensive implants right now. Thank you. <laughs>